Hello and welcome to another episode of Attacking Third, a CBS Sports Soccer Podcast. I'm Sandra Herrera, lead NWSL writer for CBS Sports. Joined today, as always, by my colleague and co-host Lisa Roman, NWSL analyst and broadcaster. On today's episode, we have an NWSL draft preview for everyone. Quick plug, MasterCard is a proud official partner of the National Women's Soccer League. The company is deeply committed to women's sports and promoting diversity on and off the field. Go to Priceless.com to learn more about how MasterCard is supporting gender equity and limitless possibilities for all. In this supersized draft preview for everyone, Lisa and I knew that we couldn't tackle this type of stuff alone. Similar to our expansion draft preview, we had a guest and we've got another special guest joining us. In fact, a friend of the pod, right? We're joined once again by Lori Lindsay, analyst. You can hear her calling NWSL matches for CBS and she'll also be at the draft desk for the expansion and NWSL draft. Welcome back, Lori. How are you doing? Uh, great. I made friend status. I am pumped. This is awesome. So yeah. good to see you too. And uh, thanks for having me on. Of course, we're we're excited. Let's uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna jump into it. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that you can catch all off season and NWSL draft coverage right here. You can follow us on Attacking Third on Twitter. You can also head on over to our YouTube page and please hit subscribe so that you never miss a new video interview or whenever we go live. Plus, you can get great highlights and we will also have live draft recaps so you don't want to miss a thing. Subscribe to youtubecom slash Attacking Third, Lisa. Let's get into it. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm excited to talk about some of these young players that are coming up through the college system um, that hopefully will make their waves into the league and make big splashes. Because when you think about all of the the great draft picks, I mean, Emily Fox this year for Racing Louisville had a fantastic season, uh, got called up to the U.S. Women's National Senior Team. Um, it's just fun to watch these young soccer players grow and really take that next step in their career. So I'm excited to talk to one of the experts here, Lori Lindsay, about all of this and all of the players coming up. But really, it's just great to have friends back on the pod. <laughs> Honestly, I agree. And you know what? Everyone's going to be able to watch watch Lori. They're going to get to see these, these players virtually sort of, you know, get the news that they've been selected. And uh, fans can go ahead and catch the NWSL draft on Saturday, December the 18th at 2 p.m. Eastern. You can watch that on CBS Sports HQ, CBS Sports Network, and Paramount+. Plus. And this is our attacking third NWSL draft preview. And again, we'll have live recaps of both of the drafts on YouTube.com slash attacking third. I guess like first things first, we should, you know, along with letting the good folks know where they can watch this, they should probably know the rules. And mm -hmm. NWSL is a place where sometimes the rules are full of question marks and that's what we want to try to provide here as you know what what we know what we know we're going to go ahead and share that so in terms of the draft rules, we know that uh, San Diego Wave FC, uh, one of the new expansion side, uh, has uh, currently has selected priority in the NWSL draft, uh, that they have the number one pick first and in the third round. Again, as of our recording of this episode, that is that is the facts in front of us. Uh, Angel City, the other expansion side, will have pick number one in the second and fourth rounds. There's going to be a total of four rounds with 12 picks. Uh, one, three, and four, 14 picks in the second round. There's actually going to be 50 picks overall because in between those rounds, uh, the two expansion sides will have an extra draft pick as well. Uh, so at the conclusion of the second round, that's when we're going to see that come to light. And uh, coin flip is what actually determined these two expansion sides going at number 25 and at number tw uh, 26. It's, it's so official with the coin flip, but hey, that's that honestly works. One for each side. <laughs> Look, as long as if they're okay with it, I think we're okay with it, right? Uh, draft order. Uh, here's what people are going to be looking for as of right now in terms of the first round. It's San Diego slotted in at number one. Racing Louisville FC at number two. North Carolina Courage at number three for the top three picks. Uh, four is Racing Louisville once again. Orlando Pride at number five. Houston Dash. Number six, North Carolina Courage. Number seven, New Jersey, New York. Gotham FC at number eight. Number nine, San Diego Wave. FC, Ole Rain at 10, Chicago Red Stars, your 2021 uh, championship final runners up will be at 11, and there is Kansas City Current at number 12, uh, rounding out the, the first round. So I want to ask you, Lori, because you are the one who's having to do all the prep work and the legwork for <laughs> this draft. Uh, when you're taking like a quick overview, when you're taking in like the quick overview 
of the rules. When you're taking a look at the quick overview of like how the draft order is looking right now, is there anything in particular that jumps out or surprises you or excites you right away? Just sort of looking at kind of the bare bones one on one that we're kind of putting out right now. Well, I think I mean right off the top, you're seeing the racing Louisville and or San Diego Wave and racing Louisville in the first two slots. I think that's what steps uh, stands out to me the most. Uh, you know, San Diego and also Angel City, both of those teams. You know, we've seen a lot of movement in the last couple of weeks to get some players that have proven themselves in the league, which, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of. I, I love movement. I think it's exciting for the league. I think anytime you can refresh teams and, you know, going into the 10th season, that seems um, to be the perfect fit as well. Um, but for, for San Diego, I, I like their approach so far. And for them to be able to get the number one pick, um, you know, to say it, I don't think it's any surprises, barring any sort of, which is very possible, let's be honest, with previous drafts and everything that goes on. But barring any sort of big trades or anything, I would imagine they'll take uh, Jalen Howell, the um, midfielder from Florida State, um, which I feel like really rounds out um, how they're putting together their roster. And then Racing Louisville has two of the first four picks. And I think for a young team that, you know, stat wise in terms of where they finished wasn't didn't blow anybody away right this their first season but put some good performances together i think anytime you can add um some top draft picks to that then this is a team i think that's going to be determined and to to turn some things around and turn some heads this season let's, even more. i hear you on that let's hop let's hop into a little bit of our, our back and forth here we whenever we have these episodes we let we get to chatting away and talking about all kinds of things so i, I actually want to get some of your reactions to some of those moves and you touched on them a little bit already, like talking about San Diego and some of the moves that they're making. And Alex Morgan was a very recent move that they announced. And at the time of our recording, there's not a ton of information in terms of uh, goods exchange, right? Like assets exchange, right? There's just an announcement that, that Alex Morgan, yes, is heading from Orlando pride uh, to, to San Diego. And there were obviously a number of other trades that, that got announced uh, within that, you know, very chaotic kind of trade window. Uh, Red Stars and Angel City making headlines with Julie Ertz and Sarah Gordon heading over to Los Angeles. Um, Ali Krieger and Ashton Harris heading over to Gotham FC. Uh, North Carolina sending uh, Samantha Mewis to, to Kansas City Current. And uh, Thorns uh, trading Simone Charlie and Tyler Lucy to sort of ensure that there was going to be some roster protection for them ahead of the expansion draft uh, as well. So in terms of maybe some of these these big names tied to the trade window. Did you have like a bigger reaction to one more than the other out of all of these moves that took place? Uh, well, before I started texting with my friends, Ali Krieger and Ashlyn Harris, I was like, what is happening here? <laughs> so, um, but then it all made sense once some of the other trades started taking place and um, Gotham, um, Kenneth Sheridan going to the San Diego Wave, their starting goalkeeper, Didi Harris going to Angel City. So it made sense they needed a goalkeeper, right? And I, I think, again, it goes back to sometimes as players, it's it's time for you to move on, just like as coaches. Right. And so to to find um, a new environment and for those two players in particular, I think that was the case. And it, and it kind of was a perfect storm for Gotham as well to get some experienced players and a proven quantity and, and goal. Um, you know, I, I like the approach of a lot of teams. I think it makes sense to go with trying to get immunity in these drafts and like protect the core of your team, especially if you felt like the, the year was successful and you want to continue to build on that. And that's always what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to give up a little bit. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I do think there were some interesting moves where some teams um, didn't have to give up anything and still got immunity and got paid. And like, there's some weird things. <laughs> I'm like, what kind of deals are happening here? But I, I would say the other one that was pretty big was Sarah Gordon and Julie Ertz. Um, but huge credit to Sarah Gordon because, I mean, what she's done over her career and uh, she deserves that, right? She deserves the ability to say yes to that or no, really. And um, so, you know, those two two big moves, I think big pickups for for Angel City, and we'll see what goes on with Chicago, still keeping a lot of the team intact. But those are two big players that um, have been mainstays for them, outside of Juilliard's being injured, obviously, this past season. But 
Lori, I can't agree with you more. There were so many times I was like reading the fine print of these trades being like, is this all you you got in return? But hey, I think expansion draft protection was a hot commodity throughout this NWSL offseason and, and all of the different trades that happen. I mean, Sandra and I have dove into it a number of times, but not just uh, with players and with teams and trades and, and coaches being announced, but this NWSL draft that is scheduled for Saturday was originally supposed to be in person in LA along with the expansion draft. And then honestly, last minute, it got changed to be virtual. And <laughs> I know we we talked with Marissa Pilla about this a little bit and like the changing of flights and, and now you're changing location because the draft is virtual. But for you as someone that is an analyst heading into this draft and, and you've been an analyst at drafts in person and also virtually last year in 2020. Does your prep change and, and how much of a curveball did, was that thrown to you when the draft got moved from being in person to virtual? Yeah, no, I mean, my prep doesn't change at all. Um, it's always fun to be in person, just like the same as, as calling games um, at the stadium, right? Instead of doing it virtual, which we had to do some during COVID. Um, and, you know, honestly, I think it makes the most sense in the end to make sure that everyone's safe and, um, you know, cut down on some travel. But, you know, I think anytime you have two, a couple expansion teams coming in and then also a, a college draft and we were bundling those together, it, it is always a bummer, though, because you want to be around. That. You want to feel the en energy of the two expansion teams and their front office and how excited they are. You can have um, players live um, there. So there is a different energy that you get. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, the prep stays. It's still these players. um exciting for them in terms of their future and uh and, and that shouldn't that shouldn't change right i think because we need to keep what's most important which is teams picking up um great young talent that are going to strive to to play at the next level and the expansion draft um well we'll, we'll see right <laughs> that'll be interesting and there's a few names on there that i'd be like i'm, I'm taking that person um but i've seen weirder things so who knows who will be left on the table or not all right, all right. Speaking of weird things, look, San Diego and Angel City, they flipped the coin for the first pick in the expansion draft and then the NWSL draft. And San Diego won the coin flip and they chose in the first round uh, and they're going to choose in the first round of the NWSL draft and that deferred to Angel City for them to have the first pick in the expansion draft. So when it comes to the weird things, what are your thoughts on this? Like the type of coin flip that it is. Uh, and if you were like, if you're going to be rocking the GM cap for us for, for this question, if you're the one having to make that decision for the coin flip, do you go the route of expansion draft first or do you go the route of NWSL draft? Great question. And typically I would 100% go expansion draft, right? Well, I guess 100% is... A little extreme because I'm going to say no to this. <laughs> but and think, typically, um, and typically is such a qualifying word because nothing is typical this year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I think even with two teams coming in, I think, it, and we can get into this in, uh, later on in this episode as well. But I, the landscape is changing so much, and it's becoming increasingly more difficult for these players to come in from the college level and make. A, a huge impact, right? Consistently get a starting position. Now, I'm not saying not anybody, right? We, as we mentioned, Trinity Rodman was lights out, one of the best forwards, if not the best forward in the league. Um, Emily Fox, right? The one and two picks came in and, and made huge splashes in the league. Um, however, I think when you look at there's going to be 50 picks, that's difficult, right? For those players to come in and, and consistently be able to perform it and start. So I would typically go the route of yes, Get the expansion draft to go get the number one so that you can pick players that you know have proven themselves. Because there's always going to be players that have done well that are going to be available because you can't protect everybody. But I think in San Diego's respect, it was smart to go with the number one pick in the college draft over the expansion draft, given how many teams had already done trades, immunity. I mean, there's going to be like what? I'm exaggerating, but like two picks, basically. Like yeah. <laughs> like one pick an hour, right? And then, okay, call it quits. So I think, it, again, as you mentioned, nothing has been typical this year. There's been a lot of movement. And so San Diego has to go with what they feel, I think, um, they know. And 
you know, as we alluded to earlier, I would imagine it would be Jalen Howell. And this is a young player that has gotten some caps with the national team. I think the college game has almost been too easy for her the last couple of seasons and has a huge upside. And if you're looking for a player of her caliber in that position, then hell yeah, you go for it, right? And then you set yourself up um, to be able to have some picks for um, the future as well, I should say. I want to know what kind of coin it is. Like, is it like a quarter? <laughs> is it like a silver, like dollar piece? You yeah, know, it's like, a silver dollar. Look is it, okay, I was going to say, like, have you that? seen like the coin flips online? Is it that? Like, that's so lame. Come who's on. Got the intel? In a room? Like, Flip a real coin. Yeah, who's got the intel? What kind of coin is it? Or like, yeah, let's, like let's move away from it. Like, this is like, let's get in some like real American, like soccer culture to let's traditions. Like, like poker. whoever wins yeah. gets to pick what they want. Let's like have like the two GMs have to like thumb wrestle. And like exactly. the winner will like <laughs> get to choose. Exactly. Okay. That that would actually fit perfectly into this year, right? Like <laughs> let's if there was ever a year where like there needed to be that introduction of like a non-coin flip, like a game, as opposed that's, to like a coin flip, like this should have been the year. That's so, exactly like, it, that's what it should have been, honestly. Um yeah. all right, Lori, we'll have you take off your GM cap for now, putting back on the analyst cap because you are a, really a namesake in a lot of NWSL homes being the color analyst for a lot of games. And anyone listening out there that really only follows the NWSL, you're missing out on a huge chunk of women's soccer that starts at the college level and, and in the college game. Um, and, and Lori, you call NCAA Division I soccer games in the SEC and the ACC where you are watching and analyzing and, and really evaluating top level college talent throughout the entire season and and we know how those regular season games and then into conference games can really change as players head into their final season um, and also with COVID years lots of things are changing but for you as an analyst that does call NCAA Division One games, and, and you get a, a sneak peek at a lot of these players that register for the NWSL draft, does does the prep help you uh, when you call those college games? Uh, are you keyed in a little bit on, on what players should? And then when you see the final registered player list, are you like, wow, where is this player? I thought they did fantastic this year. Yeah, um, it, it certainly does help um, in, a, in a massive way, um, being able to see some of these players um, over the last few seasons, especially in college. And then, um, yeah, I think, you know, in general, is has this been a little bit of a, a weird uh, draft period? For sure. Right. Because, <laughs> given just exactly what you said, because and I think it will be maybe for the next couple of years until it kind of dwindles out that like or the cutoff period of there's not going to be an additional COVID year for for the a certain class. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that's the beauty of it for these players to decide whether or not they're going to stay in, whether they're going to um to, to take their additional COVID year or, or come out early. And that is completely up to the player. And I think it's an individual choice. And, you know, I, I thought maybe we'd see a few more come out this season, um, given just the fact that like, this isn't taking away from any of the talent that's in, in the draft, right? It's just not the strongest draft mm -hmm. um, that we've ever seen. And that's just, that's just how it is. And what I mean by that is we had a lot of, um, players, top level players in college this season that were already drafted in the 2021 yes. draft, right? But they stayed yeah. their initial year and didn't go. So now they'll be going in to uh, the individual team and, and haven't played a, a pro minute yet. And then you have this class where there's some people um, or some players that we thought maybe would come out, but decided to stay. So it's just, it's a, it's a smaller pool of, I think, some of the top players that we would have expected to, to see. Um, when, when when you're doing your preparation did that stuff like have to like come into play I mean it had to like compared to other drafts that maybe you've had to prepare for like keeping in the back of your mind like well a ton of these players are who are eligible right or would or would have been eligible like actually got selected All yeah and, and and I, I really enjoy this conversation um, or this part of it too because I think it, it is interesting because we are at a, a pivotal point where there, I think there's going to have to start to be better communication between the pro coaches and the college coaches. Now, that's not to say that there's not that happening. And I think for sure that is happening in terms of identifying players. 
but I think a real clear understanding of what it means and like kind of the next couple of years, because no, is everyone that's playing college soccer at the division one level, or even in, in some of the lower divisions, are they wanting to go pro? No, we don't need to pretend that that's the case, but there's a lot that do right. And to navigate and when is going to be your best opportunity to get picked is going to continue to have to be a conversation going forward, especially with the limited roster spots. It's only 12 teams right now. Right. And we expect more to come in eventually, but that's not very much when you think about how many college soccer players are, there's not a ton of opportunity for, for them to find a roster spot. Right. So do you either play in an NHL, do you go overseas? So I think that conversation going to have to come in because to your point, this would have been a great year for some of those players to come out to ensure getting drafted, to get themselves even a better look to get a year underneath their belt, right. Before, maybe a potential tougher class comes in next year. That's even more um, saturated with talent because of just the overflow of the, the COVID year. Uh, Laura, you're almost alluding to this, but uh, that communication between the college coaches and the NWSL coaches, I'm sure it's there, but of course, transparency and communication that can always be elevated and, and always uh, honestly just made better overall. So as a as a player in college, not really knowing if now is the time to go, when it is to go. I mean, you've been in these draft rooms as a player uh, through through a number of different leagues that were thrown into the mix over the last several years. But as, as those players sitting there uh, now at their homes, I guess, virtually, but how, how much confusion and how much uncertainty is it going into Saturday afternoon, knowing that you could potentially be drafted or honestly not knowing at all? How, what are these players thinking at this point? Yeah. I I mean, you know, when I was drafted too, I mean, it was a bit more straightforward than we're seeing now. And and there wasn't as as many question marks. Right. Um, But I don't want to take away either. Yes, there is some confusion there's, but there's excitement, right? Like this is the next step. This is what you've worked for. This is, this is awesome. And to have the chance to be able to get drafted and at least get a chance to even be like, picked up by a team, right? Because just because you don't get drafted either doesn't mean that you can't be called into preseason and end up making, I mean, we, I think there's a gazillion pathways for these players. <laughs> so I'm like all for it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's the next step. I mean, it's almost, it's very similar to what it was like to sign your letter of intent to, to play in college. And then it's just another four years of commitment then. And now hopefully the next step, right? It, but I, I will say it's, you know, you get almost like four years, depending on where you go to school, like of nurturing, right? In a, mm-hmm. in a community feel. And this is this is different, right? This is it's pretty, uh, let's be honest, pro soccer, it's cutthroat. And it's uh, like a family and it also cannot be, right? So I think that's where it comes into having, you know, a lot of these players would have their co- college coaches to rely on. Um, but to continue to ingrain that even more, right? Understanding the league, understanding it as a whole, what what our coach is looking for. And, you know, these are just a trial and tribulations this year, I think for everybody and for even the the pro coaches as well to identify players and and what's best for them. Well, we're going to get a chance to, to see, you know, how that all rolls out during, during the event. And we're going to, we're going to get into some of those potentially big draft names, right. That we could see called um, during this event, particularly maybe in that, in that first round. So we're going to get into some big draft names. We're even going to ask you a little bit about, um, you know, maybe some people who got left off and in your opinions on that. And we'll do that right after a quick break. MasterCard is a proud official sponsor of the National Women's Soccer League. Together with the NWSL, MasterCard is creating priceless opportunities for both the stars of today, like MasterCard Global Brand Ambassador Crystal Dunn, and the stars of the future that are being drafted on Saturday. MasterCard is deeply committed to women's sports and promoting diversity on and off the field with investments spanning players, teams, and competitors competitions around the world to learn more about how mastercard is supporting gender equity and limitless possibilities for all visit priceless.com sandra we have to dive into some of these 
big picks that are coming up. I mean, Lori, you've mentioned her name maybe three or four times throughout this episode already. And how can you not? It's Jalen Howell, midfielder, Florida State. She's been a, a powerhouse, honestly. She's from Colorado, and she made her way at FSU, um, a, a defensive midfielder, really. She sits in that sixth position, um, picks up a lot of balls, intercepting them, scored a couple of goals as well. She has, what, two national championships under her belt at Florida State, uh, AC midfielder of the year but you've mentioned her name a lot she is projected to be the number one draft pick heading into Saturday ahead of the NWSL draft I mean it, this name has been echoed around the country and and for you Lori you've said it a number of times why is she the the biggest standout that you have on your on your list right now well I, I think it comes back to her one you know when I, I was thinking about this when you asked me the question about also the players coming out and it makes me think about how much the game and the athletes are, are changing. I mean, these, these athletes are unbelievable, right? And uh, it's just, it is elevating with the resources that are put behind um, from an early age. And, you know, I think Jalen Howell fits that mold. There's, there's no secret that the NWSL is an athletic league. It's a transitional league and um, you have to be able to keep up with that, right? And or at least find the team that suits your style if it's not completely transitional, right? And so I think for somebody like Jalen Howell, she does fit that bill. She has had experience on the women's national team. So anytime you you've had that type of competitive um atmosphere under your belt, I think that only um bodes well for you at the professional level. And and as I said, I think, you know, one the game was almost too easy, but credit to Florida State as well. It's something that Mark Gregorian, I think, has continued to evolve um, at FSU. is just a, a real professional environment, right? And I've talked to him before, and I coach coaching calls with him about a lot of their players want to play at the next level. So they do what they can to instill that while they're there, right? And so then it makes an easy transition. So then when you have a player of Jalen, again, her experience and then just her, her the ceiling that she has to be able to um, continue to improve. It, it, it makes sense because she's somebody that can come in and potentially have an impact right away. We're big fans of uh, defense on this show. We always take every opportunity that we can to remind the good people <laughs> listening that we are fans of that. And in, in our list that we've got over on CBSports.com, top three prospects. Yeah, it, go, it goes Howell, right? And this next player is in Naomi Gurma, a defender out of Stanford, uh, got her slotted in here at number two in, in our in our content here uh, because this is a player who's, uh, you know, been a part of, uh, similar to Howell, been a part of a program that has been huge, right, when it comes to you know, collegiate women's soccer. Uh, smart center back would be a great addition, I think, to – any back lines. I think when I'm looking at even just some of those first top five picks uh, that are slotted into this first round, I think that there's a few of those teams there that could probably want to like steady up and sure up their defensive back line. And a player like Girma coming in could be a, a good pick for them. Why, why is this defender stand out more than maybe some of the other defenders coming into, into this draft? Yeah, I think it's um, she certainly is a playmaking um, center back, right? And somebody that also has had experience um, with youth national teams and somebody that I, I think could have come out last year, right? But then end up having a, a, a knee injury um, and that set her back a bit, but then has come back in, in full swing and, and had a really good season. But I think it goes back to what we've been talking about too, is just that these pathways, right? Of what sets these players up for success and, you know, Florida State, Stanford, um, how many how many great players have come out of the Stanford program that have been able to step in immediately in the NWSL with their quality of play. And for a Louisville team that will certainly, you know, want to shore some things up defensively, as you mentioned, and provide depth, I think Naomi could be one of those players that could step in and, and help lead, um, lead that back line. I think you have to really look at players like that because depth at the defensive position is something that's really needed. I mean, even when you look at a team like Chicago, they had a lot of injuries this year that took out starting goalkeeper, starting uh, six in Julia. So to have depth in that position, uh, these NWSL coaches really need to be looking at that when, when you take a look at 
these college prospects coming into this draft on Saturday. Um, a, another player that I want to hit on with you, Lori, um, a, a Virginia vet, uh, your, your alma mater there, uh, Deanna Ordonez, a, a player, a forward. She is a Texas native gal, um, a junior. So a younger one that's in the mix and, and on this registered uh, players list, which is something that we're actually seeing a lot. It's either they're taking that fifth and extra year that COVID gave them, or they're deciding, hey, now is the time for me to step into this league. So or Ordonez is a junior and, and finishing her third season at Virginia, uh, but 45 goals in her career, tied for third most all time at Virginia. Um, this is a player that could we could see her go in the first round, um, depending on how things really shake out. Is she someone that stands out to you? Oh, yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, just uh, the ability to be able to score goals. And I think this is she's a prime example, too, of kind of what we've been talking about, which is a player that, um, you know, just take a look at her career and how well she's done at Virginia. Could she stay in and you know get more minutes, continue to develop at Virginia under Steve Swanson? One hundred percent. And that wouldn't be, a, I don't think, a, a wrong decision either. But does it feel like at a point in time in her career right now where it's like, hey, listen, that next class next year is is going to be even tougher, right? So can mm -hmm. I come out now, get a year underneath my belt in a in a different environment than what Virginia would give me? That's going to stretch me in a different way, which I do believe after seeing Ordonez last few seasons is ready for, right? And she has, um, you know, I think she like gives a ton of credit for her defensive abilities that she does uh, that she provides on the front line, but just a knack for a goal is no doubt. Is there a few things that she needs to get better at her movement in the box, right? I think can still continue to be even more savvy, but those are things that you learn at the next level when you're playing against um, better defenders. And especially when you only get a few chances a game. So if she's ready, then those things will start to, she'll pick that stuff up right away. And, so those are the little subtle differences, I think, depending on what players need um, at this moment and what they feel best. And talking with Steve Swanson, he's like, I trust, um, I trust her a lot, and um, she felt like this is the best, this is the best opportunity for her. I think we're going to start maybe seeing more of that a little bit as as this event kind of it went from being like the NWSL college draft, right? To now it's just the NWSL draft. The the player pool has expanded officially now already for the last two events. And along with Ordonez, there's also somebody like a, a Mia official out of out of UCLA. These these players who are making these choices kind of maybe more in the junior year versus the senior year to sort of make that decision for themselves now and say, hey, I'm gonna take my shot at at going pro and that can be really nerve wracking when you've got 200 some, you know, almost 200 players vying for, well, in this year, it's going to be 50 slots. You know, there's going to be some, some players that go home <laughs> disappointed maybe, you know, from, from this day, but in, in somebody like official kind of echoing what you've said about uh, Ordonez, this is another, this is another player that maybe we can also sort of look back into last year's draft with somebody like Trinity Rodman as well, that these are these young players where there's a lot of talent there. They've got a lot of experience, uh, uh at the collegiate level, but also the, uh, U S youth national teams. And how is that going to translate into the pro level? And like thinking into last year with somebody like Rodman, who was sort of, yes, targeted as, as a top, prospect and a top talent, but there was sort of this narrative that she was going to need some time and, and need some development. And then she went out there and did what she did in her rookie year and got rookie of the year honors and a championship to boot right at the end of it. So are we looking at players like, like Fischl and Ordon is possibly like in a similar lens where it's like, yeah, m maybe they might need, you know, some time, but there's also that high risk, high, high reward, that, that high gamble, high reward. Like if you're a team that those are players that maybe you want to take at that early slot to sort of say like this, this, the payoff from this player could probably, you know, be, be tenfold. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally think that this is, that is the possibility. And I think there's a few factors too. I think it one depends on what team you're on. Right. And I, I even with Trinity Rodman, I mean, she was fantastic from the beginning. But I think even the subtle changes in what the Washington spirit and how they started to play towards the end of the season, having the ability to not only keep possession, but being a bit more direct, play right into the hands of Trinity Rodman. Right. So not only did she have some of that um 
those months early on where she was very good and threatening. <laughs> Let's not, I'm not taking anything away from that because her first end of his goal was amazing. And I could watch that over and over. But, um, you know, there's, I think it depends for some of these players what team they're on and what are the needs, right, of the, of the team. Um, because, you know, Washington could love Ordonez let's say, and let's say they had even more attackers than they do, she might not find her spot. But I think the flip side of that too is they might grab her because they're like, hell yeah, we could use her. And we can also finally, which is, I uh, fully believe this, this is the other part. um, But I've also heard a number of coaches talk about this as well. We're finally at a stage in with this league too, with the length of the season that you can develop players now. Before it was like, oh goodness, we really got to bring players in that have to be able to make an impact. Plus the season was so short that you're like, there's no time to develop. You're either on board and you can have an impact or you don't. Right. And now you can, and now it can be one or the other, or if they need a little bit more time, there's ability to be able to develop these players. So I think it's a little bit of twofold depending on where these players, but certainly I think there's always surprises and it really, you don't know until you're in the environment. I mean, surprises you're talking about. These these are kind of our top four players that we hit on. Um, I want to hit on some more, just a little bit of personal, because I'm a former Big East player, so I have to give some love to some of the Big East players that have registered their names. There's a three Georgetown players that um, have thrown their names into the hat. So these are kind of like my wild card players that I'm keeping an eye on this week, just because I, I know them. I'm, the first one that I have coming out of this is Sydney Cummings. She's a local girl for me from where I'm from in Philly. So she's from Jersey. She played for FC Copa, which is a club I know very well. But Sydney Cummings, defender out of Georgetown. Uh, she probably won't be in the first round pick. I mean, I don't know, Lori, you tell me you're, you're more in on that. But um, this is a player, Sydney Cummings, that's really talented. She's very decorated central defender. She spent three years at Brown in the Ivy League and then transferred to the Big East um, and played her graduate year at Georgetown. She was the Big East Defensive Player of the Year. She's just one of those central defender center backs that can add depth for teams. She's a, a big player with great vision of the field and and she can find those slip passes, get them through Um, a a few other Georgetown players that are out there that I want to touch on Daisy cleverly. She's one, a midfielder that New Zealand international, she was in Tokyo at the Olympics. So she has that level where she can step it up and and really take it to the next level at the international level playing for New Zealand. And then Kellyanne Livingstone, she is uh, another defender for Georgetown. Um, So I just have to hit on some of the big East teams and the players that I'm keeping an eye on Lori for you is there anyone else that we didn't touch on that you are really keyed in on heading into this this draft on Saturday that um maybe might might not go first round but players you're just keyed in on to see where they go oh goodness you know who do you think is a sleeper pick yeah good one hold on I'm trying to pull up the list now because I know it's like super long let me see um Sandra, do you have any while we kind of throw this ball around? I know I think I you, I think you mentioned like I love that you mentioned like the uh, the international status. You know some of these players because I, that was something that stood out to me. Deal, there was actually the thing that stood out to me was that there was actually um, like a few uh, like a handful of Brazilians. You know on on this list uh, as well, where I was kind of like, okay, I'm like this is this is intriguing. But like the other thing that also like really kind of stood out to me, maybe this is maybe transitioning us a little bit, but was also like maybe the lack of like some of the players that I was surprised to not see on this list uh, because obviously leading up to, to this event, we do things like, you know, mock drafts and like who we think is going to, you know, who like, who do we think are going to be these top prospects right before this like official list drops. Um, but that was something that I think we all kind of noticed that there were actually missing names that we were kind of surprised to not see there, that there, the fact that there weren't, um, you know, a ton of like BYU players who had registered for this draft and they were the runners up in the in the College Cup uh, against Florida State. Uh, a player like Cameron Tucker, uh, a player like Penelope Hawking out of uh, Southern California was was a player that was sort of being um, whose name was sort of being put put out there as as potentially uh, a forward who could go in the first round or early second round. And that name not end <laughs> up not being registered for the list uh, either. But I think maybe. Laura, you can expand on that a little bit more and that you've been alluding to it a little bit uh, on, on the episode already and that maybe there's there's just it's not the same type of perspective uh, of the draft and of the league where it's like maybe there's not one singular path 
right, to follow or find your way onto an NWSL club anymore. Yeah. Well, I'll go my sleepers real quick. Um, Athena Kuhn, she plays for LSU. I caught a lot of their games. I really liked their team a lot. They were six at one point in time in the country early on. And then, you know, they, they lost their way a little bit, but I they have some really good talent. And she's a, a, a midfielder kind of withdrawn forward. Um, so I'll be curious to see um, if she gets picked up. It might not be till the later rounds, but she has some skill that I really like. She's crafty in some areas and be one of those players. She'd have to find herself on a, a team that would allow for that. Um, so I'll be curious about her. And then Sammy Fisher from Notre Dame. I really like her. She's a midfielder, more of attacking midfielder that I think could, um, did you say her? No. Okay. I was like, am I losing my mind? <laughs> Um, yeah, I think she could be good, um, as well. So we'll, I'll, I'll be curious to see where these, if they get picked up, I think Sammy Fisher for certainly will, um, Athena Kuhn, um, we'll see, but I'd be pumped for, for both of those players. And to your point, Sandra. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a beauty and also a little bit of the curse because it's not so straightforward anymore. Right. It's, it's like, um, it's not like, Hey, you entered the draft and then you hope you get drafted and then all right, woohoo, party time or not. And then you go try out for a team with the game growing so much. It's listen, there's so many different paths and that might include, you know, deciding when you're going to come out. Are you going to come out early? Uh, some of the players that I saw this year, there's maybe two or three that I said could come out right now. One was a freshman. And wow. now that might seem like a little bit too extreme. Um, and I don't think that's, that's for everybody. But I also think, and when I say too extreme, maybe for that player is what I mean. Like that might feel like very scary. And like, I just got to college. What do you mean I should be going? <laughs> so um, for me, I'm like, no, get on out of here. Let's go. Let's get to get, get going. We're going to um, throw you in the fire. See what you can do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, and then on, honestly, it's, it's tough. Um, but we might see players go overseas and that's okay mm -hmm. as well. Right. Cause there's always going to be movement. There's always going to be flow. There's, this is no doubt in my opinion, the best, um, and most competitive league in the world. Um, do we need to clean things up in, um, transparency as we all alluded to and have some different things moving and a bit smoother? 100%, percent and no doubt, but, it's so competitive. It's tough. So you might have some players that go overseas as well. So there's going to be a lot of different looks and, um, and that's exciting for the game. I think that's probably one of my favorite, um, favorite things to sort of take away from the draft is I, I noticed that in every, um, every draft event that's, that's taken place uh, in NWSL, there's always this really, very kind and sincere moment that happens from a lot of current players, former players, and that once the draft sort of concludes, um, there's always these sort of well wishes to the players who did not find themselves selected. Mm -hmm. And there's always that encouragement to, to not give up and that the real work starts, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to um, you covering another draft uh, Lori and I'm looking forward uh, to us at Attacking Third playing a small part in it as well. Uh, once again, everybody, you can you can find the uh, NWSL draft taking place on Saturday, December the 18th at 2 p.m. Eastern. You can watch it on CBS Sports HQ, CBS Sports Network, and Paramount Plus. And of course, we will have live recaps of both the expansion draft uh, and the NWSL draft on youtubecom Attacking Third. I want to thank everybody. Uh, for joining and listening today. Lori, thank you for being with us. You can follow us on Twitter at Attacking Third One, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you listen to your podcast shows. If you leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts with a question, Lisa and I will answer it during our mailbag segment. We're also available as video, so please subscribe to us on YouTube. Visit youtube.com slash Attacking Third. And we'll be back with a live recap coming up on Thursday night and a live NWSL draft recap on Saturday. For Sandra Herrera, Lisa Roman, and Lori Lindsay, this was Attacking Third.